Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Bear Creek. We're so glad you're here. Let's stand today. We're going to start today with worship. Let's sing together. I search the world. voices
worship you this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us here in person. Grab your seat for a few moments. Awesome to see you. Hey, we ought to celebrate that. He's the only one who can in our lives. Why don't you go? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It's true. I'm so grateful that you've gathered here for the 930 service. It's an incredible environment. And uh, I hope you really anticipate God doing something in you. We prayed so hard for that. And so, hey, I want to welcome you if you're new to Bear Creek. Thanks for being a part of this experience. You'll just notice on the screen some ways that you can connect to uh, the life of our church. And so uh, there it is, right? You see that? And so uh, please uh, feel free to do it, especially the digital welcome card. Find your phone. Um, just text the number. You'll get a digital uh, welcome card. Fill that out. Let us know that you're here, but especially if there's a prayer need in your life. For anybody if you have a prayer need that you would want us to be praying for you about, um, go there. That's the place. Also, uh, I just want to invite you, if maybe uh, you're, you're visiting Bear Creek or maybe you've been here a while and you're, cur- you're curious about a group, we really encourage you to get in a group. We have Sunday morning groups, and the way to find out about those and the way to find someone to help you find yours and actually take you there is to go to the Welcome Center and just say, tell me about groups, and they'll be happy to help you in every way. It'll be an awesome uh, experience for you. We're um, going to worship together some more here in a moment. I'm just really going to encourage you really just to lift up your heart, lift up your voice, and uh, just release praise and joy in in God's presence. But before that, we're going to pray. We have two things we do during this prayer. We pray for needs, but also this is the moment that we worship the Lord and how we give. Our giving to the Lord is worship, and it's an incredible and important part of it. It's how we, it's one of the ways that we give ourselves to the Lord is we say, God, everything that you've blessed me with, everything you've done in my life, I show you the gratitude by how I give back to you. And so this is the moment for that as we come out of this prayer If you want to use a a digital means or go online or use one of the giving boxes in the back of the room, I'm encouraging you to give back uh, uh, to the Lord. I'm going to ask us to stand together, and um, I want us to pray. And I I just want us to start by praying for the needs that are all around us. Hurricane Ida is about to invade the coast of Louisiana, a Cat 4 or Cat 5 storm. It's going to be potentially devastating. We just want to pray for the people who are in its path, for their safety and for their well-being. We want to pray for just the devastation that is happening all over our nation, but in our community from COVID and what it's doing in people's lives. We just want to pray for God's presence and His power in our lives. Let's bow. Could we, Father, we welcome you into this place. And what we mean is we're opening our our hearts to you and we're surrendering to you. And we're asking you to forgive us and cleanse us of just going our own way. And, Father, we pray that you help us feel and know and experience your presence. And, Father, our hearts are for those who are in Louisiana right now about to face this incredible storm, God, we pray for their safety and for their well-being. God, I want to ask you for I want to ask you for all those we know and those we don't know who are going through COVID right now. I ask you, Father, for your protection in their lives as well. We just ask you, God, to be the healer in their lives. And we want to trust you with that. And God, I want to pray for the storms that people in this room are going through in this moment. I just want to ask you, Father, to be the same Jesus that calmed the storm that night on the Sea of Galilee, to be the same Jesus to calm the storm in us. And and, and Lord, I just pray that we lean into you and just make you Lord and leader of our lives. That moment can begin in this moment. That we're going to lift you up. We want to lift you up. 
as Jesus on the cross and as Lord of our life, lift you up. We pray it now in his name. Amen. Let's continue to worship him. We worship him and lift him up in our hearts and in our minds. This is an invitation to worship. Where you're at, let's sing together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us bow down before Him. His banner is love over us. His mercies are new. His mercies are new. Every morning. His mercies on you every morning we sing.
high, Lord. You are the Lord. You're forever lifted high.
can trust you. We can put our hope in you. living hope, our one true hope, Lord. Thank you that, that you're trustworthy. God, thank you that we can give you our lives, that we can surrender ourselves to you and not have to worry about things, Lord. Thank you that you are our God, that you are the Lord. 
Lord, today we lift you high above anything that we may be going through. Lord, today as we hear news of things happening around our world, we lift you high even above those things, Lord, declaring that you alone are God. Lord, that you are God. You're also compassionate. You're also kind, Lord. You're patient. You're slow to anger. And for that, we thank you. We worship you. And that's why we put our hope and our trust in you. So today, God, speak to us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit be in this place. Move us, convict us, bring change into our lives, Lord, that we leave a different person. So God, we give you permission to do what you can do in us today. Speak to us now. Have your way in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's church said, amen and amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. You can grab your seat. It's been amazing. We turn to the Word of God now, where God's presence is found in how He speaks to us. And so let's be open uh, to that. So we're in this teaching series that's called Pray Radical. And I get it that it doesn't make sense uh, at first, but it mostly means that there are a few things that if we have the courage to pray them and to stay with them, They can have a radical effect on our lives. We've identified four of them biblically. There are more, but these four are enough to drastically change the arc of your life, to drastically affect the whole nature of your relationship to God. And our desire here in this series is nothing less than absolute spiritual reawakening in our lives. We prayed like so urgently about it that God would just, there would just be this fresh wind of God's Spirit over us through these four pray radical prayers. So if you haven't been with us, real quick, here's the first. Uh, We went through this one already, Psalm 139, we've learned to pray, search me, O God. And then the second from last week was from Psalm 51, and, and it takes a lot of courage, more courage than you can imagine, to pray, break me, O oh God. And then today, the third, we began to explore the third today. It's going to sound odd at first, but here it is. The prayer is, not me, O oh God. Probably doesn't mean exactly what you think. It it feels odd in the moment, but you need to know that this comes from the most intense prayer that Jesus himself ever prayed. It's from the most critical moment in his earthly life. And you need the principle of this prayer uh, in your life because there are going to be certain critical moments uh, in your life where. What you decide to do in that moment or what you choose to do in that moment is going to affect the rest of your life. Sometimes you will sort of know it, that this is a really critical, crucial moment. Other times you won't even realize that what you're deciding, what you're doing, what you have chosen is going to affect the rest of your life. But you've got to be ready to pray like this because it could affect the outcome of the rest of your life. And believe it or not, your, out- your outcome could rest on two words, not me. So let's discover this together. It's found in Mark 14. And Mark for, the setting of Mark 14 is that it is the last night of Jesus' earthly life. And the place is a place where Jesus had led his disciples uh, to many times in Jerusalem. It's a garden, really it's an olive grove um, called Gethsemane. In fact, uh, this image is an image of Gethsemane today. These are ancient, ancient olive trees. 
And so before this night is over, Jesus leads his disciples into this place. And before this this night is over, he's going to have been betrayed by Judas, abandoned by all of his disciples, arrested by a mob, falsely accused by jealous, envious religious leaders. He's going to endure a kangaroo court and then be mocked and humiliated uh, uh, and falsely convicted, sentenced to death, and the next day... He will be crucified, executed by crucifixion. But but what is Jesus doing in, in just the last couple of hours before he is taken, before he is arrested? What's Jesus doing before all of that unfolds? We find him in this, in, in well, what was there? <laughs> we find him in that grove of olive trees. Um, scholars think that it, in Jesus' day, it was walled. It had an olive press. It was owned by somebody that Jesus knew well. And, and so there he is with, with his disciples, and he fully knows that this is the critical moment of his entire earthly life. And now let's open it up in the Word of God, beginning in verse 32, Mark 4. And the Bible says, they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here uh, until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. Those words are huge. They are so important. We're going to explain them later. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. I mean, honestly, do you think Jesus is an exaggerator? Or do you think his soul is deeply grieved to the point of death at this moment? Remain here, he says to them, and keep watch. And, and so he went a little beyond them, and he fell to the ground and began to pray that, uh, that if it were possible that this hour might pass him by. And so he was praying, verse 36, he was saying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, the most intimate word he could use to identify his Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, here's the prayer, here's the point that we're focusing on, yet not what I will, but what you will. Not me, not my agenda, not my desire, but what you want in me. Verse 37, it follows, and so he came and he found them sleeping, the three, and and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Verse 42, get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And so this is the Word of God, and it speaks in a supernatural way because it's that powerful. And so let's open our hearts to it and watch, watch this idea. Watch this idea come out uh, of this passage. And that is this, that, that I've got to learn to pray, not me. For the Lord to have all of me. In order for the Lord to have all of me, I've got to learn to pray this prayer, not me. There's the idea that we're going to build an entire message around over the next few moments. And so, so to learn to pray that prayer in a way that it changes you, the, to learn to pray the not me prayer in a way that it actually affects your life and changes who you are, you need three insights. You need to pray them, pray it with these three insights fueling this prayer. And what are they? The first one is that this prayer is a battle of flesh and spirit. This, ba- this, this prayer is a battle of flesh and spirit. That's what's happening in verses 38 through, uh, I'm sorry, 35 through 38. Jesus praying this prayer, finding his disciples sleeping. And the insight, the insight that he gives Peter is, is huge. It's so, it's critical to us. And that is where he says, look, Peter, look, look, you got to keep praying. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
And so it's a battle of flesh and spirit. And so to explain that, listen, listen for four key words, the reality, the battle, the weapon, the question. Those four words, the reality, the battle, the weapon, the question. What's the reality? The reality is what I just said, verse 36. Spirit is willing, flesh is weak. It's a principle that Jesus says, you've got to get in you for this prayer to mean anything to you. The Bible describes your inner life in, uh, in multiple ways. The, uh, the New Testament acknowledges your mind, your heart, your will. It acknowledges uh, your soul. Uh, it acknowledges your, your, your spirit and flesh. And so for a lot of people, that's just sort of swimming around. I don't know how to see myself. Listen, the perspective to focus on in the New Testament is focus on this spirit and flesh. Focus there. You're, and, and so let's, let's describe that. What is your spirit? Your spirit is the part of you that has the capacity to know God. And your spirit before Christ is actually dead. The, the, this is a part of the new birth. When you place your faith in Christ, it's not a decision for you to say, I say this all the time, this is, it's not a decision that you're making that, you know what, I'm going to be a better man. Actually, when you place your faith in Christ, a supernatural thing happens to you. And that is, in a place where you were dead, you come alive. And that's in your spirit. The Bible teaches us that over and over. It's brought to life when you place your faith in Christ. And so it's a supernatural thing that God does. He brings you to life when you receive Him. And so, and so consequently, your spirit is where you're out. It's where you're aware of God. Your spirit is the place in you that actually gives you the capacity to be aware of God and to actually commune or interact with His Spirit. Um, it's the place in you that relates to Him. The Spirit of God works in you in your spirit. Now, on the other hand, your flesh is the part of your inner nature that remains uh, from your brokenness, after you ask Christ into your life, your spirit comes alive, but your flesh, there is a residue of your flesh in you. What is that? It's a residue of your fallenness. It's the core selfish desires that only want what you want, that only want to please yourself. Even after you come to Christ, there remains this residue of your flesh in you. And Galatians 5 tells us that spirit and flesh battle. Somebody, somebody said to me after the other service, it's talking about the Holy Spirit there. And the answer is yes, it's the Holy Spirit in your spirit. Uh, you have to choose. You have to make this choice to allow the Spirit of God to uh, influence your spirit. But it's got to operate out of your spirit. And so it's the Holy Spirit operating in your spirit and you choosing by your spirit to do this battle. And so, and so the, the Bible says your, your spirit and your flesh set themselves against one another. And Jesus is giving us a huge insight here that our spirit is willing to live to please our, our Father in heaven, but our flesh is weak. He means that our, our flesh is so vulnerable to what our flesh wants in the moment. And so, therefore, there is battle in you. And so, the first is the reality. I said, listen for the word reality. Now, listen for the word battle. Uh, the battle, where is the battle? It's in your desires. Look at where the battle is fought, Galatians 5. Verse uh, 16, right? Look at it. Verse 6, but I say to you, the Apostle Paul writes, walk by the Spirit. In other words, you living in this sub submissive role where the Spirit of God is operating in your spirit, and you will not carry out what? The desire of the flesh. That's where the battle is fought. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please, meaning, meaning there is this battle of desire in you. The apostle Paul says, this is where your battle is. The reality is you have conflicting desires. You want to please God sometimes and sometimes you want to please yourself. Sometimes your desire to please God is so strong, you blow off anything in the flesh. 
Sometimes your flesh feels so strong, too strong to resist. And so you fall into just pleasing yourself. It, you're, you're, the battle, the battle is fought in your desires. And when Jesus says in verse 36, not what I will, the word that he's using there in the biblical text, the word thelema, th- thelema means a desire, a deep desire. It's what I intend. And he's saying, not what I desire, not what I intend, not what I want, God, but what you want. It takes enormous courage to pray that and stay with that and to mean that until it changes your life. And Jesus is consciously saying to his Father, but not what I desire, what you desire. He's doing exactly what the New Testament commands us to do uh, with our flesh, with our own desires. Those who belong to Christ, Galatians 5, 24, uh, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Romans 8, 13, if by, this, if you, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the, the body, the flesh, then you will live. What what those passages and others like it are telling us is that this is a constant act of faith. If if you want to know, if you want to know how to have victory over your flesh uh, at the point of fleshly desires, it is a constant act of faith. Even though you may have a strong desire to go your own way, if you do this, if you declare your desire to please the Father, however weak it may feel, emotionally feel in the moment, declare... Declare your death to your flesh. Declare your desire to please God. And the Spirit of God inside your spirit will bring a power into you to make your desire to please the Father strong and overwhelming. And it'll kill the desire of the flesh. Here's why that's important. Listen to this sequence. Desire becomes intention. And intention becomes decision. And decision becomes what, becomes what you do. That's why you battle at the point of your desires. But there's a third word I told you to listen to, the weapon, the weapon. What weapon do I use in this battle? Jesus, how is Jesus accomplishing this? In uh, uh, how is he doing it? Well, look, it's what I'm just saying. He's praying. The, ba- the, the weapon, the weapon is prayer. And so what is he doing? He's praying. And then as you read further in the text, he's praying. And then when you read even further in the text, he's praying. He's praying over and over and over. And he's telling his disciples, you two keep on praying. He has to go and wake them up over and keep praying. But they keep falling asleep physically and spiritually over and over uh, that night. And so what happens? Jesus wins his battle. They lose theirs. Because the weapon is prayer. The battle is fought and won in prayer. But there's a final word that I wanted you to listen for, and that is the question. And look, this, this, listen, this is, this is what you are answering, consciously or unconsciously, the, you are answering this question every day of your life. If you're a Christ follower and, and you claim him and you say that you want uh, to follow after him, th- there is a question you are answering every single day, whether you are uh, conscious of it or not, and that is this, does he have all of me? And this prayer is a part, this prayer is a part of the process of day by day giving him all of you. Listen to Jim Elliott, a missionary to Ecuador who was martyred taking the gospel to an unreached people group many years ago. There's just a point at which he wrote, wrote, one does not surrender a life in an instant. You know, you can decide that. There can be this first moment that you decide, I'm not going my own way anymore. I'm, I'm turning and I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering my life uh, to, to Christ. And there is, a, there is an instantaneous uh, aspect to it, but, but you will wake up tomorrow and realize that you have to surrender again and the next day, and the next, and the next. And so that's why he concludes, that which, is a life, that which is lifelong can only be surrendered in a lifetime. 
And so this prayer, this not me prayer, is a, is a, spiritual, it's, it's a spiritual exercise that ought to be a part of your life or of your day. And the exercise of it should be this. Uh, does he have all of me? And answer, listen, answer that honestly every single day and offer him what is not his. There's a second insight. For this prayer to be life-changing in you, uh, the, the, the first reality, the first reality is to recognize that it is a battle of flesh and spirit. But the second insight to, to embrace is that it can only be motivated by love. Now, there are a lot of motivations for following Christ, there are a lot of motivations for obeying God. And, and look, if there's any motivation that, you know, causes you to turn toward God and walk toward God, okay, it's an okay motivation. But the motivation that will a- absolutely break through and change you and transform you in every possible way is that, is that it can only be motivated by love. Can I show that to you? Verse 36. Now, we're about to plunge into something heavy. Verse 36 Jesus is praying desperately here. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is deeply and urgently asking the Father to give him another way to remove this thing, this thing that's in front of him to, 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 to help him get out of it. I mean, he's even expressing his faith in the Father. I mean, listen to that. All things are possible for you. Do you think Jesus was doubtful of that in any way? I mean, the three years of his ministry, he did incredible miracles. He saw God do anything. I mean, all things were possible. Jesus knew that, and Jesus is pleading toward that. You can do anything, Father. Remove this cup from me. When the text says, earlier in the passage that Jesus was distressed and troubled, it turns out that those are the worst possible words. The Greek word for troubled there means horrified, horrified. What would it take, I mean, not in an exaggerated way, what would it take to, what would you have to see for you to be horrified? And I don't, I'm not trying to trigger terrible events or terrible memories. I'm just saying, just think of what it would take for you to be literally horrified. And Jesus is experiencing that in this moment. In the next verse, Jesus tells the three that he's about to die from the distress that he's experiencing. I mean, this is incredibly serious stuff. And so he's asking, he's asking God to remove this cop from me. What, what, what is he saying there? Well, in the Old Testament, the cop was an ingrained me- Old Testament metaphor for God's fierce and, and righteous wrath. It's terrible but righteous wrath on sin, on injustice, on evil. And here's what theologians think are happening in the moment. The father, in this moment, is showing his son hell. He's experiencing what hell is. The wrath of God on sin, the evil and injustice, and it's being poured out on him. Do you remember the whole reason for the son's coming? It was to pay the penalty for our sin, to, to, to pay the cost of the wrath of God uh, on our sin. And the father is beginning to pour out his wrath for you and me onto Jesus in that moment. And it horrifies him. There's an 18th century theologian who asked, why did God let Jesus see that now and not wait until the cross itself? Why would he do that to him? Wasn't, it, wasn't that dangerous? Well, I mean, why would he so horrify his son before the cross itself? Why didn't God wait until Jesus was on the cross uh, uh, and, uh, in order to do this? Why did God show it to him now? And he answers 
I'm going to sort of paraphrase it. He answers, it was so that we could see Jesus go to the cross willingly, fully knowing what he was going to experience for us. Voluntary, voluntarily knowing full well the depth of horror that he was about to experience so that his love for us would be unmistakable for us to see. Why was Jesus willing after knowing the horror? The answer is, Jesus says it in John 14, 31, just as he is entering into the garden. John 14, 31, but so that the world may know that I love the Father. Look at Jesus just saying it loudly and clearly. I love the Father. And because I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. He's going into the garden. He loved the Father, and His depth of love is shown to us here, totally nourished by the Father's love for Him, John 4, 34. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and accomplish His work. He loved the Father, but also He's doing this out of His love, His incredible, unfathomable love for you and me, John 15, 13, no greater love. Uh, can a man have? Then he laid down his life for his friends, and then he says to his disciples, you are my friends. I mean, what did you, listen, think about this. What did Jesus have to gain by going to the cross, especially after knowing this horror? Let's see, is it more glory? No, he's already the most glorious one. Is it more power? No, he already has authority over all the universe. I mean, uh, I mean, is it more creative power? No, he's already spoken the world into existence. I mean, there is what, what else is there to gain? What does he gain by going? There's only one thing. Hebrews 12 says, the cross was joy for Jesus because he would knew it, it would mean he would gain us. He would redeem us. He would get us to love and nourish and cherish. He would gain you. And so what would motivate Jesus to pray, not me, not my will, not my desires, but yours, even in the most horrifying uh, circumstance, it was from love. It was from love. And it is only love for love that will give you the motivation to subordinate your flesh, your own agendas and desires for what God wants. It can only be love for love because you love him. And you want to do what pleases him. The only way for your spirit desires to grow stronger than your flesh desires is for you to love him more than anything else in this world. Here's what motivates your love, and that is his love for you. That is why we say all the time here, preach the gospel to yourself every single day. In other words, in other words, in your imagination, go to the cross and watch Jesus go to the cross. Watch his hands nailed there. Watch him lift it up. Watch him take on the full wrath of God in your place for your carelessness, for your selfishness. There he is taking on that horror out of love for you. There's a third insight you need. For you to learn to pray, not me, in a way that changes your life, it comes with these three insights. And the third insight is not just that it is battle of of flesh uh, and spirit, and not just that it is motivated by love, but the outcome is a certain thing. The outcome will be an obeying life. And Jesus literally does that. And he literally demonstrates that in verse 42. Look at what he says to to his disciples after going through this prayer experience and after saying, not me, not me, God, but you, not what I want, but what you want. Verse 42, then he says to them, get up, get up, let us be going. And behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Jesus literally gets up and starts walking toward the mob that hasn't even shown itself yet, but just to express, Father, not me, but you, he gets up and he begins to walk into it. He begins to obey. He obeys. Love toward God 
Listen, just, just be real. Love toward God comes out of you as obedience, plain and simple. Don't claim how much you love him if you've got a set of six things or seven things that you don't really agree with, you know, God on, so I'm not going to really do those things. It means that you learn to obey in the things where your desires are weak. It means that you learn obedience in the things that you don't really agree with him about. Let's close here. There are two outcomes to an obeying life, two outcomes. One outcome is cost. The New Testament over and over says we crucify our flesh, our desires, our going our own way. An obeying life has a cost. It's a crucifixion of your own agendas, your own plans for you. It's a crucifixion of the secret sinful stuff that, that's inside of you. You don't tell anybody about it, but it just stays there and festers. It's a crucifixion of that. Obedience is crucifying that. How long are you going to just let it lie there? It's a crucifixion of character qualities in you that don't reflect Jesus, your lust, your jealousy and envy, your anger, your worship of money or status, your worship of another person's attention or, or whatever it is. It's about crucifying those things. It's about obedience, and obedience is about cost. But there is a second outcome of an obeying life, and that is a blessed life. I think it says it in the clearest, most, uh, the, 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 the clearest way possible in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is part of the Old Testament law. And, and Deuteronomy, though, primarily Deuteronomy is a goodbye sermon from, from, from Moses. He's ministered to God's people for decades and a generation, and he's about to separate from them. And they're about to step into the promise, into the promise of God. The promise is the promised land. And so he has said all that he has said in Deuteronomy up to chapter 30. We're going to look 28 for a second, but, uh, but 30 and then 28. Just listen to what he says. He says, in conclusion, basically, he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Listen to verse 20. By loving the Lord your God. Choose life by how? By loving the Lord your God. By obeying his voice. By holding fast to him. For this is your life and length of your days. Connect that to 28, 1 and 2. Now, he says, now it shall be that if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high. It's an outcome of an obedient life. He will set you high. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you, and they'll overtake you if you obey the Lord your God, you have an absolute promise of God that if you learn obedience, obedience will, uh, 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 a blessing will overtake your life. And the outcome, uh, uh, the operating obedient life is a life that comes from a courageous prayer, not me. God, not me, not my agenda. Not what I want, but what you want. Could we bow together? And as we bow, I'm just asking you to be open to the Spirit of God in this place. We've so prayed and we believe that God's Spirit is present and strong in this place. How would you know it? If you feel a, a pressure, a presence in your heart, there is God's Spirit speaking. And what is He speaking to you? Through the Word of God today, He has said, pray. Have the courage to pray, not me, O oh God. 
not what my flesh wants, not my agendas, but you. It's the courage to ask, and I'm just urging you, ask this right now. Father, show me, do you have all of me? And what comes up? What is it that you're holding as your own? What is it that you're not letting go of? What is it that you just, you just let stay in your life and you know the Lord doesn't want it there? Why don't you confess that to him? Why don't you call on him to make your spirit desire strong and to defeat and crucify and kill your flesh desire? Have the courage, not once, every day to pray, not me, oh God. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Pastor Tim's going to come and share a second. Thanks. What a great way to begin the week and um, wonderful message from Pastor Deb. Hope you've been encouraged, challenged, um, reminded of how much God cares for you and has what's best in store for you. So um, we want you to know we're getting ready to launch several new things going on as we get past uh, next weekend's holiday weekend. And um, we've got groups for all kinds of folks. Um, we've got some support groups. So if you're wanting to enrich your marriage or you're dealing with grief and you want to be a part of a grief, share group. We've got that going on. We've got some ladies Bible studies that are kicking off uh, throughout the week. We've got some uh, classes, uh, Faith and Work, which helps people discover God's plan for their life and how to search for that best job for themselves. We also have a class in Spanish in Faith and Finances and how to put God first in your finances and manage what he blesses you with. So um, there's all kinds of stuff. There's stuff for moms getting ready to kick off. So be sure and take a look. You may have been handed a card as you entered in. Otherwise, you can check our website or stop by the booth out in the lobby. If you're interested in any of those classes, we would encourage you to take advantage of that. Plus, we've got a grow group starting on Wednesday night. Same study as what we do on Sunday morning. And here next week, they're launching into how to discover and have more joy in your life. And so uh, as they go through the book of Philippians and apply God's word to our life and discover how God wants us to live with joy, I'd encourage you to get to be a part of a group and share life with other people and study God's word and encourage one another. Um, would invite you to be a part of our groups beginning next week. Uh, they also are meeting today, so you're welcome to go check them out today as well. Listen, I, I want to pray for you. I just hope that you have a wonderful week. It is so great to see you at church today and those of you joining our broadcast. God, God, I stand here. I am a sinner in need of your grace. I thank you for your son, Jesus. And God, I do pray that it's not me. It's not my life. But God, I declare my dependence upon you that I would want your life to live in me and through me that, God, I might reflect your love and your hope and your joy and your peace, that the fruits of the Spirit would be evident because, God, I want the life you've intended for me because I know that's what's best. When things are hard and when things are great, that I would always follow you. I pray that for everyone here in this room, that that would be our commitment together as we leave this place. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.